The sun is scorching and the summer long. Why not spend your leisure time enjoying a feast for the senses? In June 2019, Hantang Culture was invited to the Unlock Sensational Italy campaign run by the Consulate General of Italy in Shanghai. Everyone, whether wandering around or on a study tour, can find a place of his own in the historical and friendly country of Italy. Unexpected pleasant surprises may be waiting for him in unusual destinations. The Mediterranean port city of Genoa, located on the northwestern coast of Italy, is an important economic and cultural intersection in Europe. Genoa reached its heyday in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Strada Nova and 42 Raleigh palaces are listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and bear witness to that time. Fin dal Medioevo, Genova era una repubblica, era guidata da un doge, ma non c'era una casa reale, non c'era un re, non c'era un principe. In questo modo si poneva il problema di chi a Genova potesse ospitare i re, i principi, i potenti del mondo quando venivano a visitare la nostra città. E quindi c'era molta ricchezza. Le famiglie nobili costruirono questi meravigliosi e ricchi palazzi che eh, a turno ospitavano, a seconda anche della loro bellezza, eh, gli ospiti della città. Le sono ancora usati, molto spesso come quelli che ci ospitano ora sono musei, gallerie d'arte, ma spesso sono anche case private, eh, spesso sono anche eh, ancora di proprietà di un'unica famiglia. I musei di Strada Nuova sono un complesso di tre differenti palazzi, Palazzo Rosso, Palazzo Bianco e Palazzo Tursi. Hanno origine dalla magnificenza di una donna, Maria Brignolessare, duchessa di Galliera, che nel 1874 donò Palazzo Rosso alla città. Più tardi nel suo testamento donò anche eh, Palazzo Bianco alla città. Palazzo Rosso ancora conserva tutta una serie di ritratti di Van Dyck eh, realizzati per la famiglia Brignole Sale. Van Dyck, che era stato a Genova a partire dal 1621, perché arriva qua come allievo più talentuoso di Rubens e perché c'era una ricca clientela che aveva bisogno di essere raffigurata e, e trova lui qua il modo di inventarsi questo ritratto celebrativo eh, che porterà poi nell'Inghilterra nella di Carlo I Stuart. There are many masterpieces of the 16th and 17th centuries in the art collections of the Palazzo Rosso and the Palazzo Bianco. The balance and solemnity of classicism, the richness and dramatic effects of Baroque, and the energy and humor of Genoese artists can all be found there. Since 1848, the Plaza Dori Tursi has been the seat of the municipality of Genoa. It now hosts Niccolo Pagnini's beloved violin, the Canon. Built by the Italian luthier Giuseppe Antonio Guineri. Two and a half centuries later, the violin is still in good condition. In the narrow streets of Genoa, you can often find time-honored shops. This candy shop has not changed its appearance since it opened in 1814. Founded in 1780, the brand hasn't changed its practice of making candies by hand from natural ingredients. It has formed sweet memories of childhood for generations of Genoese. To the southeast of Genoa, in the hinterland, is the second largest city of the Tuscany region, Prato. 
The city has long been the heart of Italy's textile industry, and its prosperous economy is coupled with historic artistic attractions of great significance. Siamo all'interno del Museo del Tessuto di Prato, che è una realtà proprio dedicata a raccontare la storia del tessuto eh, non solo a Prato, in particolare un nucleo molto importante di materiale è rappresentato dai tessuti rinascimentali, forse una delle collezioni più importanti d'Europa. Nel Rinascimento il tessuto, la produzione del tessuto era molto importante, abbigliarsi con eh, capi di abbigliamento e tessuti ricchi era, rappresentava uno status molto importante. Eh, I tessuti erano materiali preziosi che avevano un costo paragonabile a quello dei gioielli, que quindi erano un vero investimento. The Prado Cathedral, in Romanesque style, dates back to the 10th century. In the early 15th century, Michelozzo di Bartolomeo and Donatello built the pulpit on the new facade of the cathedral. Inside the cathedral, there is a white marble sculpture dating back to the Renaissance. Made in the 15th century and still viewed today, the delicate carving of the Sphinx is still very impressive. The frescoes in the main chapel are probably the most outstanding works of Filippo Lippi. In the mid-15th century, the painter was living in Prato. This group of frescoes, covering an area of 400 square meters, took Lippi and his assistants 14 years to complete. The life of Jesus was portrayed within one fresco. The painter's contemporaries could also be found in the painting. It was just like a scroll painting that connected ancient times with the painter's era. Salome is still performing her dance, while the head of John the Baptist has been cut off. Cause and effect, life and death, confront each other on the wall. The ancient Roman cloister of the cathedral exhibits a unique Florentine style. Green serpentinite are interlaid with white marble, capitals of Corinthian order and zoophoric capitals made by the master of Cabestini in the 12th century bear witness to the passage of time. Walking through the cloister, you can come to the Prado Cathedral Museum. The medieval rock walls are still solid, sheltering the art of different eras. In the main gallery of the 17th century art gallery, you can see the guardian angel of the Baroque painter, Carlo Dolci. In the painting, this angel guides the boy to look at the light but the boy's eyes are still fixated on the flowers of the secular world. The outstanding chiaroscuro and detailed depictions make viewers vividly feel the light and the dust. The acclaimed 19th century Prado painter, Alessandro Franchi, painted the Transporto di Santo Stefano with amazing chiaroscuro techniques. A beam of bright light is cast on St. Stephen's body. His golden robe lights up his young face while mourning friends stand in the dark. The Palazzo Pretorio was once Prado's city hall. It was formed by merging three buildings of different functions in the 13th and 14th centuries. Today, it is the Prato Civic Museum. The end of the 16th century saw the rise of mannerism, of which the last Florentine school painter, Alessandro Allori, was an outstanding representative. He created figures with sculptural, slender, and dynamic bodies. 
His compositions are often exaggerated and extremely intriguing for their power. The 17th century was an era of Baroque and naturalism. The French painter, Trofim Bigot, known as the Candlelight Master, painted this, The Mocking of Christ. By its side is a Neapolitan Baroque painting from the same period. Giovanni Battista Caracciolo's Nolimitangere. Compassion, hope, sorrow, and sarcasm are clearly depicted under the strong contrast of light and dark. Apart from art, Prado's food is also unforgettable. In one of the Medici gardens on the outskirts of the city, the chef is preparing biscotti, traditional Tuscan almond biscuits. Fresh eggs and seasonal fruits are mixed with flour and butter and kneaded into long strips. Baked twice, they take on a golden color and great aroma. Goethe once said, to have seen Italy without having seen Sicily is not to have seen Italy at all. For Sicily is the clue to everything. As the largest island in Italy, Sicily is a region prosperous in economy and culture and closely connected to nature. Palermo, the capital of Sicily, dates back over 2,700 years. Stratified traces of each era can be found in the ancient remains. The Palermo Cathedral was built in the 12th century and is characterized by a mix of styles from different periods. Many of the decorations in the cathedral, including reliefs and life-size statues, were created by the 15th century sculptor Domenico Gagini, who once learned from the early Renaissance architect and sculptor Filippo Brunelleschi. In this fine holy water stoop, you can see the integration of artistic styles. In 1801, the Italian astronomer Giuseppe Piazzi built a meridian here. Midday, sun would travel through a small hole in the dome and fall accurately on the corresponding month and zodiac. Palermo has the largest opera house in Italy, Teatro Massimo Vittorio Emanuele. Located in Piazza Verdi, the theater was designed by the architect Giovanni Battista Basile. The opening was held in 1897. The foyer is in solemn and symmetrical Romanesque style. The dominant October color resembles autumn leaves. Acoustically perfect, the horseshoe-shaped auditorium is filled with gorgeous decorations. Golden stuccos, thick velvet and blossoming flower lamps made from Murano blown glass. The splendor fills one with anticipation. The Rocco Latini painting on the ceiling is composed of 11 petals with central stamens. It depicts the goddess of music and the muses dancing and playing instruments. A unique cooling system opens in the ceiling to let hot air escape. Opposite the stage is the royal box. It also has a private royal sitting room with large mirrors on the walls. The mahogany wood and red brocade decoration are extended in the mirrors, like another stage. Getting its name from the ancient Greek and Roman style decorative paintings, Pompeian Hall seems to be staging a vibrant dance lasting forever.
the Opera de Pupi, inscribed on UNESCO lists of intangible cultural heritage properties, is located on another street. There was a unique troubadour tradition in Sicily during the reign of Frederick II in the 13th century. In 1835, the Cuticchio family opened the first Opera di Pupi, and their handmade marinettes of wood have entertained several generations of audiences. Wood marinettes are brought to life by the puppeteers. The rise and decline of the Carolingian dynasty, pilgrimages of Paladines, and the myths of Sicily Voices and history all echo through these marinettes. Common emotions in human nature connect the ancient with modern times. After a feast for eyes and ears, you can spend the afternoon wandering around Palermo squares. Your favorite cafe may be there waiting for you. Since 1928, Ideal Café Stagnita has been run by its founding family. The café selects beans from various species of coffee, roasts them using traditional methods every morning, and then blends and grinds them to perfection. Each cup is a gift from four generations of coffee makers. The trip took us to Catania on the east coast and the second city in Sicily. Etna is the highest active volcano in Europe and its violent outbursts have destroyed large parts of the city twice, but it also brings fertile soil and fresh water. A statue of an elephant made of lava stands in the Catania Cathedral Square. Built in the Byzantine era, the statue has remained undamaged by natural disaster and has become a symbol of protection for the city. The Catania Cathedral, which was built in the 11th century, was severely damaged by volcanoes and earthquakes. It was rebuilt in the Baroque style after an earthquake in 1693. Lava stones that once overwhelmed a great part of the city supply the main material in an unadorned style, implying the strength of nature. There is a long pottery making tradition in Sicily. Located in Catania, the brand Caramica di Simone was founded in the 1960s by the Palermo potter Giovanni di Simone. Clay is modeled as desired in the hands of a skilled potter. After a period of drying, objects covered with a white layer are then decorated manually, yellow for lemons, green for cornfields, and silver for olive trees. Pottery wares are now dressed in the colors of the fields. Richness of nature and Sicilian folk tales are common themes found on this adorable and exquisite pottery. Our last stop is the amphitheater of Catania, an imposing structure built in the Roman imperial period, probably in the second century AD. The arena was originally encircled with water. Marbles and balsite stones scattered about date back almost 2,000 years. With cavia of three levels and each of 14 steps, the theater was able to hold about 15,000 spectators. Wide subterranean tunnels were built to evacuate the crowd. After so many years' abandonment, its simple elegance and grandeur have turned into primitive and tranquil remains in the modern bustling world. In Italy, beauty is everywhere. Buildings fall to ruin, but glory endures. 
immerse yourself in its resplendent antiquity, in its eternal, sensational enchantment. <laughs>